Kim Tridman is an award-winning poet and novelist who comes from the Boston area. She worked as a medical writer for most of her adult life, and it wasn't until her 40s that she uh, began with some other type of creative writing, which was her novel. And she began to spend more and more time working on her novel and eventually became interested in poetry when taking a break from writing fiction. Kim said that she needed to do something else for a while, a little smaller and more immediate. And poetry made so much sense to her. And so she began to work on a smaller scale, in writing in a more distilled way, with none of the restraints of traditional storytelling of her novel. She went on to write, indeed, and in a prolific way. Uh, in the past few years, she has published two books of poetry and one novel. And the novel earned the 2012 James Jones First Novel Fellowship. And Kim also became a bit of an activist uh, for the world uh, as she was uh, investing her time more and more in creative writing. And after the earthquake uh, that devastated Haiti in 2010, she developed a large collaborative poet poetry reading for Paul Farmer's Partners in Health of 18 renowned poets, including several Haitian American poets. It was a huge event over at Longfellow House, and it earned uh, $4,000. And it was covered by NPR Here and Now with Robin Young. And in addition, uh, this, the poetry from that event was compiled into uh, a collection of the poems that were read by Kim. And um, due to the generosity of a small press, every penny of the money went to Poets for Haiti, to the Partners in Health. And that earned an additional $10,000. Kim said that poetry is meant to be shared. It's this kind of fusion which involves in no small part the magic of theater. What could be better than hearing the words precisely the way the poet meant to be heard? For me, in many ways, a good reading is like a musical performance. It's all about phrasing, rhythm, and emphasis, and the exquisite beauty of a note struck in the right way for precisely the right length of time. And so now I would like to welcome Kim Tridman up to share some of her music of poetry, some of her story of poetry, uh, some of her words to captiv captivate us all this morning. If you please give her a warm round of applause. So to Plum, this first section is Plum with a B. Witch Hazel. Winters lie long up here, lead-bellied and mean. Evergreens grow even darker in the cold. Outside, the witch hazel prostrates herself to an unruly wind. Two people at a small wooden table. Imagine them taking their morning coffee their blue china mugs. A dog curls beneath them by a cast iron grate. Say one of them looks up and gazes at the sky, absently perhaps, wondering about this or that. An eye could come to rest upon a small yellow flower, spindly, unkempt in its way, yellow nonetheless. It is late February, not even the beginning of the end of winter. New souls have yet to stir within the tireless womb. It is not impossible. Imagine the flowers came, say they even existed. Fractured. Darling, you will never know. On my way to work, the plane fell from the sky, but just a small one. The radio played a song you've never heard before, and my jaw was clamped so tight I couldn't speak. Everyone thought I was crazy or just putting on airs, the sheer humiliation. They said I'd never, never had my feet on solid ground. There were no geese up there either. They must have sensed that this was not the best of years for birds. 
When I wake these days, my sheets are soaked. The water pools between my breasts. You sleep like you have always slept, one foot thrown off the far end of the bed. My next poem is the title poem um, called Plum, spelled with a B, and it's in sections. I think there are four short sections, so um, I'll just pause briefly between them. Plum. If the walls are made of hair, imagine then the timbers as bone. One day we arrived. We brought with us our money, our expectations. We could picture it all back then, hearth-hearted, backbone of stairs, windows opening their eyes beneath a lintel's earnest brow. From the gut, we mortgaged our future. Time will tell, the basement whispered. Doors could fly open, gullets could flare. The grout could someday seem a kind of gristle. From here, I can tell you some of the stories. You see the way the light, the way the sun slantwise milking the glass, and the mind traverses even the oddest little spaces. A tiny ravel in the carpet, the thread-like crack above the door. <coughs> there is a nest of hornets in the wall, drilling, bumping up against the plaster. I sit and wait. Surely some of them will make it through. Stingers poised, hindquarters quivering with cabined rage. I slept the deep sleep of a queen. In my dreams, the walls were plumb. The windows of the house were painted black. If night existed, I could not see it coming. If there was wind, there was no evidence, no disarray, no broken limbs. Years later, I awoke. The bed was smaller than it had been. There was a groaning. The walls began to tremble and pitch. Through a scratch in the paint, a gleaming dagger of moon. It's nothing, he said. Go back to sleep. He smiled as he reached for the paintbrush, humming narcotically. Beneath the sheet, my fingernails were sickle black. Each year, the wisteria staked its heights on something larger than the average house. It grew and grew. Once supple, its green stick fingers petrified and crooked. Spring came. The sun warmed the earth. In summer, wood wasps whined and hurtled through the lacy green. I did what I did best, sitting clear-eyed in its dappled shade. It's no good, he cried. We'll lose everything. He hacked and hacked. The wisteria roped her sinewy arms around the porch. Never mind, said the fence post to the stoop. Between them, a leaf crabbed, the walkway choked with weeds. Two crows set down with outspread wings to juxtapose their shadows. Next one I chose because on my way over here, um, a V of Canada geese came down right over the car, and, and I was kind of uh, wondering to myself which way they might be going at this time of year. <laughs> So this one is very much to, the, to that point. It's called signs. The hostas, for instance, how leggy they grow, and those rickety ladders of lusterless blooms. Look, I know what it is, an ending again, a sorting out of times. I can lift my head and see the contrails parsing up a church blue sky, and the old dog readies herself for a winter she may or may not see. Beneath the nasturtiums, dried leaves hang like crumpled paper hats. We have been here before, you and I. A north wind whispers yellow to the trees, and the old wicker chair sits waiting, putting on her poker face. 
It's only that wayward flock of geese, recklessly ignoring all the signs. Only they don't seem to know which way to go. Unreliable narrator. Do you remember the rain? Do you remember the dog barking? Didn't she die? Wasn't she carried away in the night with the storm? What time was it then? Was it March? Was it spring? Was it raining? Didn't the water churn like oceans round our feet? Were you there? Do you remember the look on my face? Do you remember the rain and the crash and the dog barking? I remember your voice like the trees, even at night in the wind. I remember the noise. I remember the flashing of teeth. You wouldn't look me in the eye that night. Was it the time? Was it the night? Was it the spring? Weren't the houses lit from within and the people in the houses warm and dry? Weren't there clouds? Wasn't it raining? What was the dog doing in the road? There was the feeling of her weight in my arms and then only the rain and the smell of spring rain on the dirt. And there was a moon as the night would have it. Yes, of course. Do you remember the moon? Do you remember the words? Do you remember you could not look me in the eye and the rain swallowing our feet and the promise of more and the dog in the street, silent? Were you there? And here's one for um, this insufferable month. It's called Chokehold. But winter, howling, chill choked, knife blue sky sharpening its edge against the iron of the earth. Every day an accusation, branches like bones pointing, pewter shards of ice. It's a lot of work, this breathing and breathing. Wind wheezed, eyes seamed against the steel, red hands weeping white. Air is less than air. Even the cypresses, gasping, drained of color, more black than green. Okay, I'm going to move into, well, I'm going to read one more poem here, and this one, this one is very relevant. My youngest daughter just went off to Rome a couple days ago, um, having gone off to college a couple of years ago, but this feels like a much bigger move. So this one's called Residue. Yesterday, there was too much room in the world. Eyes, breath, the willow weeping, and always the damage. Words swallowed whole, tremors at fault lines. The sharp, mean memory of sun leaves gone. Still, occasionally, I find her ballet tights in the laundry. I fold them slowly, set them on the stair up to her room. On the phone, she sounds quite breathless, a paper's due, the Kirovs coming to New York next month. She speaks so fast, I only listen to the speed. It's obvious now, time rushing through and standing still, the sky aubergine. None of it planned, not the wind circling like hawks, not the blight. It's dark at four, her shins are tired. I wonder, is it late enough to pour a glass of wine? The house fills up with too much space. Each cat now has a room to call her own. I used to love my bedroom door, but now I leave it open. Between breaths, the only lasting solace, the table, the lamp the thick, round custard of light. OK, now we're going to move into section plum without a bee. And um, so think juicy, think fleshy. Um, it's a whole different order of magnitude in here. <laughs> so we're going to start with a poem called Fresh. Leave September to its own devices, and what do you expect? Even along the ocean, you can smell the conquered grapes, even with an offshore breeze, even when all you're looking for is some clarity and peace of mind. And this morning at the market, the pomegranates were on fire, burning with lust or shame, I'm not sure which. 
All I wanted was an apple to bite into, juicy but firm, something to revive me mid-morning with a second cup of coffee. But it was whole foods, of course, and the apples were confusing, and the produce man was surprisingly attractive, and the passion fruit was displayed prominently right there by the sliding doors. <laughs> Dinner at Trist. Let me put on my glasses so I may savor you. Citrus spray of lines around the mouth, slow eyes of dough rising. Even your hands, the sinew, the flesh curing, the way they wait and wait, the butter of your sudden smile. Let me muddle the soft mint of you, sup of your custard, the eggs, the milk. Siren. She has a pillbox, he said, but hair like flame spills down her back. Otherwise, there was a hatchet in her car, and next, that ruby patch of poison ivy. It was too much, he said. Her hair spills down her back. Words fall from her like bits of burning ash. At midday, just a windless calm. Somewhere out there, he hears the wail of a siren. And he steps outside, barefoot, without thinking. Socks. I've often fancied you with just socks and a briefcase. <laughs> Black socks, that is. And maybe it's strange, but no stranger really than, any, than anything else. Than the light in the room, for example, or the dog. Details is what I mean to say, plus you've never looked that you've never looked half bad either, even from behind. It's just a snapshot, just like any other, not a world, not a war, just a moment, the kind that maybe sticks around for a while or not, but it does that thing anyhow. The way the muscle it twitches, eyes, lips, heart, light tripping on and off like a loose bulb in an old socket. The way for just a moment you breathe and you breathe and you recognize with a clean and ancient joy that you are breathing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the work of Tony Hoagland, but he's a um, personal favorite of mine. So this, is, this, this poem was based on a line from one of his poems and his poem was called a Color of Sky, I believe, which is fabulous. And my poem is called Plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> hey, babe, I have a wonderful poem for you, but it's someone else's. Something about stains and time and the color of sky. Beauty, of course, relentless. That phrase he used, the very tint of inexperience. It made me want to bathe in it or sleep break silently at a very unlikely angle. The world is capable of such things, drowning us on a whim. There are winter shadows, thin as wire, and the sky outside my window is breathless with blue. Above the chimney, earnest plugs of smoke. You are that stain, of course, the one I can't get out. Ruinous, glorious, immutable. Five minutes. This one's called Lost in Translation. I thought you said yes or something like it, something juiced, a plum, and time out there calling and calling, moon swaddling us like silvered gauze. I thought there were eyes talking, mouths hearing every single word, not to mention the pulse. But enough about you. Perhaps you didn't know that when I tip my head, the clouds no longer matter, nor the light, that the red fruits on the dogwood fall without a sound. Even that thing we made, glitter and fire and silk, that thing we never really knew how to hold, I have lost that too. Okay. 
this is in this is in my last section, which is called. Let me remind myself. <laughs> Laden, L A D E N. Momentum. On the fifth day of the snow, the daughter leaves, saying, I may be back. The sky does not exist. In the kitchen, soup simmering until the end of time. The mother. It is the long hour before dinner and dark. She walks from the kitchen to the hallway and turns, looks back to the beginning. On the fifth day of the snow, the daughter leaves, saying, I have no choice. The sky exists, but elsewhere, and oh, so many colors. There is a pulse like drums. There is the suckling red. No, she says, gathering her things about her. I don't care for any soup. This one's called insurance. There is one thing I get right. Every spring I plant the nasturtiums. My husband shakes his head, says, for God's sakes, why don't you just do pansies like everyone else? I know better. It's insurance, I say. He walks off and shrugs, turns on his weed whacker. I go about my business, not planting pansies, stuffing fat seeds into thin holes punched too close together, packing the future tight. It's a long summer, but a short one, too. Iris to Coreopsis to New England Aster, suns up and down. Come September, the evenings grow chill. Kids are off, the house goes mute. Dried oak leaves scritch along the walk like small arthritic hands. Only the nasturtiums are becoming, teeming, cascading, extrapolating, luxuriating in their greenness. Even the blossoms tipped in gold, their little open mouths. This poem is called Move Over. The girl in the story is old now and short of breath. The girl, the girl in the story is old now. Just look at her neck, the backs of her hands. Just smell that sour belly breath. The girl, in the story, the girl looks at her old lady neck, breathes into her hands and smells. The girl smells. On her hands, the girl smells the cold cream her mother once used on her. Like her mother, the girl smooths the cold cream in slow motion circles. Slow motion. Circles of shadows, circles of shadow under her eyes, and when she coughs, tiny sprays of lines around her. The girl coughs, smooths the lines around her mouth where the dimples once were. So smooth, her granddaughter says, feeling the soft, warm dough of her upper arm. On the sofa, the girl, the granddaughter says, the girl says, the girl says, how old are? And this is the final poem of the book. Uh, it's called Pro Provisions. I bought one pomegranate this morning just to admire it. They were two for five dollars, but I was only purchasing color. Can we eat it, my daughter asked that evening. She was limping through her chemistry homework watching me, watching the pomegranate. Not until I'm finished, I answered vaguely, wondering what exactly that meant. It sat on the counter, defining red. Even the tomatoes knew not to argue. When my husband came home, he palmed it absently, then rolled it down the hallway for the dog. It's in my office now, catching the afternoon sun. I'm not sure why it matters so much, but it does. I know that the seeds inside are waiting, jewel-like, encrusted in their pulpy womb. But for the moment, I'm content just to see it there when I turn my head, sitting quietly on the sill, concentrating all that color in one place. 
Thank you very much. In this divine moment, I float above old frog pond, weightless among the cattails and damselflies. Though scolding crow flushes great blue heron from her perch, my calm abides. I am light, I am song, I am the fauna and the flora, sunbeam and cloud. I am doe dreaming in the orchard, muskrat paddling toward shore. I am the trill of blackbird and sparrow, the bruised leaf of lady's thumb, the first sweet burst of blueberry on the tongue. I am the beech and ash, the deadwood and the sapling. In this divine moment, I shed the final tether of the hidebound realm and rise. I am held only by the holy now. On a shelf in her dining room, the red truck her father bought, hoping for a boy. <laughs> Blank squares in the crossword puzzle my brother left at the cancer clinic. Answers we never find. Trees where 